This is Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gottbaum. Today we try to understand why a new strain of H5N1 influenza found here in the U.S. is raising lots of questions and concerns among scientists. There are new fears in this country about the potential impact of the H5N1 bird flu on humans. Dairy After workers first... with concerns growing about avian flu spreading, scientists at the University of Pennsylvania are working on a new bird flu vaccine. Scientists say the bird flu is showing signs of mutating. It and is become... Ohio State Lab veterinary epidemiologist Andrew Bowman is testing milk from six states and finding traces of bird flu where he shouldn't. This is what does that tell you about One of the big concerns about potential increased human spread is the deadliness of the virus. Since 2003, the WHO says there's been 889 cases and 463 deaths globally, putting the fatality rate at about 52 percent. This virus has traveled huge distances. It's crossed the Atlantic Ocean, it's crossed the Pacific Ocean. If South Asia is not far either, and we know this virus is there. So I think it's certainly just a matter of when. To understand more about what's happening with this new strain of H5N1, we're joined by Dr. Eric Rubin, NEJM Editor-in-Chief, and also Deputy Editor Dr. Lindsay Baden. Both are infectious disease specialists. So Lindsay, I'd like to start with you. H5N1, otherwise known as bird flu, has been around for at least 30 years. The majority of outbreaks have been in bird populations worldwide. And we've seen some cases in humans, but what is happening here in the U.S. is different. Can you explain? What has happened recently is that it has gotten into dairy cows. That is a novel event, and it's spreading substantially in multiple herds in multiple states. And we've actually seen from data that there are events in the virus that change its transmissibility so it is able to spread in this new mammalian species. With that spread, it raises concern that it may be able to spread further. Eric, what are your concerns here? We know a lot about flu, particularly about human flu and how it gets transmitted. We have very good human surveillance mechanisms throughout the globe. We actually know a fair amount about flu in domestic bird populations and something in wild bird populations as well. Now, of course, I'll point out that we've never really looked for flu in cattle before, and it's conceivable that there have been outbreaks in cattle before that we just missed. But the cattle thing is something new, and new is bad because we don't know much about it. It's very difficult to make predictions when we have no knowledge base that we're acting on. The more virus there is, the more chances that there will be a mutation which is bad. It's a roll of the dice. The more times you roll the dice, the more likely you are to get something. So the larger the population of viruses in cattle, the more likely you are to see these viral variants that might do something that we don't want them to do. When you talk about this, what have you seen go on that makes us worried about this specific strain in terms of behavior and other pandemics we've seen and the flu? Well, I might start with the fact that many of these viruses are really adapted to birds, and they're not particularly adapted to mammals. This one is clearly very adapted to at least one mammalian species. Beyond that, we know it can infect and kill cats because that's been seen in farm cats. And experimentally, if you feed infected milk to mice, they also get infected and develop a fatal disease. So this is a virus that's starting from, it's pretty good at mammals. What it isn't good at is transmitting between humans yet, as far as we can tell. And so there is still a substantial barrier to an outbreak among humans, but once again, going back to the roll of the dice question, the more humans that are exposed, the more likely you are to select for that virus that can make that jump into humans and perhaps transmit between humans. So obviously this is a different strain. It's a new strain. And we don't know what happens with a new strain. We're seeing it move quickly into dairy cattle. 
And some farm workers who've come into contact with those cows have been infected, presumably from milk. What do we learn from the fact that dairy milk has been infected with H5N1? That's a tough one. And that gets into the things we don't know. We think of influenza as a respiratory virus, and that's how it transmits efficiently. Now, what happens if you drink infected milk? If you're a mouse, then you get flu and you die. But is that because of the way the milk is getting in and some of it's getting aerosolized a little and it's getting up into their nose and causing infection up there? Or is that because it's penetrating through the gastrointestinal tract? We don't know. Have we seen people being infected by drinking raw milk in this country, unpasteurized milk? Not yet. But remember, the cases that we know about in humans are farm workers, and their exposure to milk products is very different from what we have at home. Cows are being milked, milk is being aerosolized, and the evidence suggests that maybe they're getting infected by different routes. So I think there's a lot we don't know, but one of those is what are the risks involved with infected cow milk? But Rachel, I would use this as an opportunity to remember why we pasteurize milk to begin with. So when you do PCR, you may be able to detect viral sequence, but the pasteurization process kills the virus and other pathogens that we're not thinking about. But your point, Rachel, is that this shows that this pathogen has made it into dairy cows, has made it into the dairy cow products like milk, and we need to be monitoring that and responding accordingly. I think that gets to the question of surveillance. We need to know more about how is it transmitted, which cattle have it, given that, what's the likely route of transmission? So all of those questions, I think we don't know the answer to yet. We don't know how many cattle are being surveyed, how many farm workers are being surveyed. As far as I can tell, there is not a systematic approach to doing that. That's quite reminiscent of COVID, that there wasn't a systematic approach taken to understand the epidemiology of disease, which plays into the biology and your ability to both predict what might happen and to control what's going on. So what needs to happen now? I, I think there are real gaps, and we have to think about developing the science while we are trying to understand the event. So we need to develop serologic assays to be able to look for who's previously been infected. We need to make sure our PCR molecular diagnostics are able to detect this pathogen and its variants if it has variants. There is a program where if a novel H5N1 makes it into the bird population, there's culling of birds to decrease the risk. So there are strategies that can be deployed to curtail the amplification and spread in the animal populations around us. That requires some science and some systematic investigation. Then we need to understand what is the spread in the people at highest risk, such as those who are on the farms working or in other ways. And then we need to think about acute illness. And that's where nucleic acid or some of our other molecular technologies need to be available so that clinicians can be able to diagnose so that we're able to do clinical surveillance if warranted because there's evidence of transmission. What are the obstacles for doing this? So we have a very atomized structure in public health. This was a significant problem during COVID when there were different authorities with different rules and different ways of collecting data and different ways of communication. If we needed vaccination, how are we going to use those vaccines and how are we going to require them? In this case, if you're a dairy farmer, it is not in your interest to have your, your cattle tested, probably. And there are some states who are doing it well and some states that are not, not doing it as well. It's not a federally controlled program. Should we be testing all farm workers? Yes, but we have to do that with the permission or the force of law for lots of different localities. So we don't have a very coordinated system. And lack of coordination undercuts systematic approaches. Lindsay, your thoughts? I think there are a couple of issues here. 
there's a coordination issue, and our public health system is very decentralized, which has certain advantages, but it has incredible disadvantages when we're trying to understand the emergence and dissemination of a highly contagious novel pathogen. And that's where, as sort of Eric was getting at, where is the coordination to investigate, to assess, to to cross-inform at the county level, the state level, the federal level, at the human care interface, at the animal husbandry interface, and how do we connect those? So then this makes us more vulnerable. And, and didn't we learn from our last pandemic what to do? I think we learned what we did wrong in many cases, but I'm not sure we fixed the problems. Oh, I would say it makes us vulnerable, absolutely. I wish we learned. I look at learning as it translates into investment and paying attention. And I have a feeling we as a society have a short-term memory. We are responding to a public health threat today, but if it's not clearly a public health threat, then we'll wait and see. And that means we're always going to be playing catch up. And, and what do you mean by we're vulnerable? Explain what's at stake here. Well, in this case, the concern is, is that the H5N1 that has made it into cows and is spreading efficiently in multiple mammalian species, if it is able to make the jump to people and have a respiratory route of person-to-person transmission, so it behaves like seasonal influenza, then I think we're in a heap of trouble very quickly. Eric, do you agree? I want to say this now and... I probably want to repeat this. There is no massive human outbreak right now. And there very well could not be of this virus. In fact, it's not unlikely that we will end up with a a viral outbreak in animals, a very small number of people infected. No one's been all that sick so far and that it blows over. But let's be clear, whether this is the time or another time, we're going to have a flu outbreak. This is a good acid test for how to respond. And we're not doing so well. One of the issues with COVID is we learned a lot, but are we better at responding to a pandemic now? Or are we worse at responding to a pandemic because the preparedness issue has been very heavily politicized? So have we gotten better at tracking and responding to possible epidemics? With SARS-CoV-2, we did learn a ton. We are able to have rapid diagnostic tests at home that can be manufactured, distributed to scale. We have PCR tests that are scalable. We have wastewater monitoring. We can make monoclonal antibodies. We can make vaccines quickly. So there are many platforms that have emerged, that are scalable in different directions. What we need to do is have the science to know when to do that and to have more systematic surveillance that can inform us when we should be more concerned. So let's talk about vaccines. I understand that the EU is getting tens of millions of vaccines ready for H5N1, and the U.S. says it has about 5 million already stockpiled. Are these for this specific strain, and are they ready to be deployed? H5N1 vaccines have been developed, not for the current strain, but for other strains that have infected humans. And they have been moved through clinical trials, approved, and put into the national stockpile in limited quantity. These vaccines have evidence of providing what we think will be immunity to the current circulating strain in cows. At the same time, new vaccines are being developed that directly match the current strain. What we don't know is the level of protection this older H5N1 vaccine would have for the current, nor what the current vaccine would have because there are no studies. But it does signal a little bit of effort and resources that have been utilized in preparedness over the last decade. But it may not be enough if things were to expand rapidly. 
So there are a lot of unknowns, including who pays for the development of vaccines that might or might not be effective for a large-scale H5N1 outbreak in humans. Part of the issue with getting a vaccine approved for a pathogen that's not circulating means there is no return on investment, there is no financial incentive. And this gets to your questions earlier, Rachel, about how do we prepare and have an economic environment that supports that preparation so the incentives are aligned with what we need in a timely fashion? Let me draw a, a substantial contrast with, with SARS-CoV-2, where we had nothing and we ramped up the science and then eventually the production of vaccine because we already had an outbreak that was ongoing. The hard part at this point is not the science. It's really the decision-making. When are you going to spend the many hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to produce these vaccines at scale with a lead time that's going to be months in order to make them before we know whether there really is a human outbreak? And I think that remains a difficult problem. When do you want to spend a billion dollars on vaccines? It's not an easy decision. I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. We can spend a billion dollars, have 300 million doses ready for the American population, and then never use it because there's never a pandemic. And in a couple of years, we throw it all out because it expires. How do we make that decision when to spend the money so that we're ready to go for an event that may not happen? What's your answer to that as infectious disease scientists? I think the answer goes back to what we were saying before, which is that surveillance is really important. Surveillance can help us answer those questions. But if we're working in the dark, it's very difficult to know. And we need a lot more investment in understanding the burden of transmission and infection to have the facts to make a decision on when to pull the trigger. So thank you both very much for joining me. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. That's Dr. Lindsay Baden, deputy editor at the New England Journal of Medicine, and Dr. Eric Rubin, NEJM's editor-in-chief. We had help from our managing editor, Deborah Molina. Our engineer is Adam Strauss. Next time, so-called race corrections have been used in medicine as a way to diagnose and treat patients for generations. But are they helping or causing harm? We were taught in medical school in lung function testing, you want to compare to a normal quote-unquote person of their same kind of background. And they did tell us that one of these ways that was really important and relevant was race. And yet, Whenever I got to these minority patients, according to that measure, they really should be achieving these higher outcomes because they weren't as sick. And yet those are the people that I was seeing in the hospital more. And those are the ones that were, you know, having a more difficult time. And so it's like, well, what's going on here? That's next time on Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm Rachel Gottbaum.